A lot of people are starting to think we're moving a little bit too fast, the plugins and all this. And so the Future of Life Institute, which was formed in 2015, it's a nonprofit that's focused on de-risking major technology like AI. They did a petition titled Pause Giant AI Experiments, an open letter. A bunch of computer scientists assigned this letter. Letter quote says, we must ask ourselves, should we let machines flood our information channels with propaganda and untruth? Should we automate away all the jobs, including the fulfilling ones? Should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete and replace us? Should we risk loss of control of our civilization? A number of notable tech leaders like Elon, Steve Wozniak, and a handful of deep mind researchers have signed it. What do you guys think of the latter? Are we going to slow down or not? What do you think, Sex? I think there's a difference between what could happen in the short term and then what could happen in the long term. I think in the short term, everything we're seeing right now is very positive. And let me just give you an example. There was a really interesting tweet storm about a guy who wrote about how Chad GPT saved his dog. And did you guys see this? This yeah, was, you this was one chat, of the yeah. really mind blowing ones to me, uh, use cases. So his dog was sick, took him to a vet, vet prescribed some medication. Three days later, dog's still sick. In fact, even worse. So the, the owner of the, the pet just literally copied and pasted the lab result for the blood test for the dog with all the, the lab values into chat GPT and said, what could this be? Like, what's your likely diagnosis? Chat GPT gave three possible answers, three illnesses. The first one was what the vet basically had diagnosed with. So that wasn't it. The second one was excluded by another test. So he then went to a, a second vet and said, listen, I think my dog has the third one. And vet prescribed something. And sure enough, dog is cured, saved. So that's really mind blowing that even though chat GPT hasn't been specifically optimized, as far as we know, for lab results, it could figure this out. The reason I'm mentioning this is it gives you a sense of the potential here to cure disease, to, you know, like I could see major medical breakthroughs based on the AI in the next five or 10 years. Now, the question is, like, what happens in the long term? You know, as the AI gets smarter and smarter, and we are kind of getting into the realm of science fiction, but here would be the scenario is you're on chat GPT 10 or 20 or whatever it is, or maybe some other company's AI. And the developers ask the AI, hey, how could you make yourself better? Now do it, which is a question we ask ChatGPT all the time in different contexts. And so ChatGPT will already have the ability to write perfect code by that point. I think, you know, code writing is one of the, I think, of its superpowers already. So it gives itself the ability to rewrite its code, to auto update it, to recursively make itself better. I mean, at that point, isn't that like, a speciation event, doesn't that very quickly lead to the singularity if the AI has the capability to rewrite its own code to make itself better? And, you know, won't it very quickly write billions of versions of itself? And, you know, it's very hard to predict what that future looks like. Now, I also don't know how far away we are from that. That could be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever. But I, I think it's a question worth asking for sure. Is it worth slowing down though, Sachs? Should we be pausing? Because Based on what you said, and I think you framed it properly, when these things hit a certain point and they start reinforcing their own learning with each other, they can go at infinite speed, right? Th th this is not comparable to human speed. They could be firing off millions, billions of different I think you're right. uh, scenarios. We're definitely now on this fuck around, find out curve. Yeah. And so there is only one way to really find out, which is somebody's going to push the boundaries, the competitive dynamics will get the better of some startup, they'll do something that people will look back on and say, Whoa, that was a little that was a bridge too far. So yeah, we're just, just a matter of time. Yeah, I, I think we're not going to slow down. I actually think it's going the other way. I think things are going to speed up. And, and the reason they're going to speed up is because the one thing Silicon Valley is really good at is taking advantage of a platform shift. And so when you think about like all the VCs, and all the founders, you know, everyone accuses us of being lemmings. And so when there's like kind of like a fake platform shift or people kind of glom onto something that ends up not being real, everyone's kind of got egg on their faces. But the flip side of that is that when the platform shift is real, Silicon Valley is really good at throwing money at it. The talent knows how to go after it and they keep making it better and better. And so that's the dynamic we're in right now. You look at 70% of the last YC class was ready, all AI startups. I'm sure the next one will probably be 95%. So 
I think that we're on a path here where the pace of innovation is actually going to speed up. Companies are going to compete with each other. They're going to seek to invent new capabilities. And I think the results are going to be, all be incredibly positive for some period of time. Like, you know, the VET example, we're going to cure illnesses. We're going to solve major so if problems. if they're positive, then we invest more, we trust more. But the paradox of that, as Chamath is pointing out, Freeberg, is if we trust it more, we invest more, then some person in a free market is going to say, you know what, I need to beat ChatGPT. Therefore, I'm going to take the rails off this thing. I'm going to let it go faster and take off some constraints because I need to win. And I'm so far behind. How do you feel about that scenario that sort of Chamath and Sachs teed up, Friedberg? I think there's like GPT-3, I think, ran on 700 gigs. Is that right? G Does anyone know what GPT-4 runs on? It's got to be on some number that's, you know, not too, not, not a many multiples of that. But look, someone could make a copy of this thing and fork it and develop an entirely new model. I think that's what's incredible about software and digital technology and also kind of means that it's very hard to contain. Similar to like what we've seen in, in biology, ever since biology got digitized through DNA sequencing and the ability to kind of express molecules through gene editing, you know, you can't control or contain the ability to do gene editing work at all because everyone knows the code. Everyone can make CRISPR-Cas molecules. Everyone can make gene editing systems in any lab anywhere. Once it was out, it was out. And now there's hundreds of variants for, for doing gene editing, many of which are much improved over CRISPR-Cas9. I use that as an analogy because it was this breakthrough technology that allowed us to precisely specifically edit genomes and that allowed us to engineer biology and do these incredible things where biology effectively became software. And remember, CRISPR-Cas9 gave us effectively a, a, a word processing type tool, find and replace. And the tooling that's evolved from that has, has, is much better. So whatever is underlying, whatever the parameters are for GPT-4, whatever that model is, if a close enough replicant of that model exists or a copy of that model is made and then new training data and new evolutions can be done separately you could see many many variants kind of emerge from here and i think this is a good echoing of chamath's point we don't know what's ultimately going to win is there enough of a network effect in the plug-in model as Sachs pointed out to really give open ai the sustaining competitive advantage i'm not sure the model runs on 700 gigs that's less data than you know fits on my iphone so, you know, I could take that model, I could take the parameters of that model, and I could create an entirely new version, I could fork it, and I could do something entirely new with it. So I, I don't think you can contain it. I don't think that this idea that we can put in place some regulatory constraints and say it's illegal to do this, or, you know, try and, you know, create IP around it or protections around it is realistic at this state. The power of the tool is so extraordinary, the extendability of the tools are so extraordinary. So the economic and, you know, the various incentives are there for, you know, other models to emerge and whether they're directly copied from someone hacking into open AI servers and making a copy of that model or whether they're, you know, open sourced or whether that someone generates something that's 95% as good and then it forks and a whole new class of models emerge. I think this is like, it's as Sachs pointed out, highlighting the kind of economic market uprooting, social uprooting potential and many models will, will, will start to kind of come to, to market.